Okay, so welcome everybody. My name is Alex Caples. I'm the Director of Cybersecurity and Technology here at ASPE and I'm delighted that you've all been able to join us for this combined ASPE and Observer Research Foundation webinar event on critical technologies competition in the Indo-Pacific. So I'll be your moderator for the session. I'm joined by a fantastic panel who I'll introduce in a moment uh, for what will no doubt be an interesting and very topical discussion. But just to, to start off to kind of set the scene for us all, I think it's now almost a truism to point out that the growing great power competition has, has created greater uncertainty in this region. We're seeing this play out in the critical technology space in some fairly obvious ways, as both the US and China move to de-risk their supply chains and develop sovereign capacity, and as they each prove more willing to use export controls for critical technologies, whether to secure their own access to those technologies or to prevent other nations from securing access to them as well. So for states in the Indo-Pacific region, that really means rethinking how we navigate this more uncertain world to ensure that we can fulfill our critical technology needs and in turn our strategic and economic aspirations. So just to say that although the title of this webinar mentions competition, the intention of the webinar is really to explore opportunities. So yes, we need to recognise and discuss the different strategic and economic drivers at play across the region, but that shouldn't prevent us from identifying where opportunities exist for dialogue and cooperation on critical technologies and where whole of region approaches might be useful and appropriate. So the aim of today's discussion is really to take us beyond the discussion of great power competition in and of itself and to explore firstly specific technologies and tech areas in which we can build cooperation or consensus. And secondly, practical measures that states in the region can take to strengthen trust and build resilience in their existing technological capacities. So a couple of housekeeping uh, or, uh, rules and a little bit of an over, overview of this webinar. There's two parts to this. In the first part, each of our four speakers will have five minutes to provide a brief overview of the economic and strategic considerations that are front of mind for their region. So that's Australia, India, Southeast Asia and the Pacific, um, as well as to offer up a couple of technologies or areas that they believe would really support stronger or more in-depth regional cooperation. And then we're going to move into a more free-flowing kind of 20, 25 minute panel discussion to unpick some of those concepts and suggestions before we open the floor to audience questions. So. <clears throat> Just a quick couple of things I should say to viewers, please don't feel as though you have to wait until the end of the panel session to send your questions through. You should see a questions button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So please feel free to add your questions throughout the session. Equally, please feel free to, to upvote questions that other people have put in there that you think are interesting. Um, you can put those in as being general or to a specific panelist. So if you, if you um, go through that for the course of the, the session, we will endeavour to put at least a couple of those questions to the panel towards the end um, and then see what we can, can do about perhaps putting out some of the answers to questions um, that we didn't quite get to in this session as part of a broader kind of release of this webinar and the transcript. So speaking of the panel, we're privileged to have four of the best here this evening, this evening Australian time. Justin Bassey is the Executive Director of ASPE and a former National Security Advisor to Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull and a former Chief of Staff to Foreign Minister Maurice Payne. Dr Raji Rajagopalan is the Director for Security Strategy and Technology at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi and a former Assistant Director for the Government of India's National Security Council Secretariat. Dr Min Tan is the founding executive director at the Tech for Good Institute and a senior fellow at the Centre for Governance and Sustainability at the National University of Singapore, raising awareness really about the role tech plays in the digital economy. And Mary Fafita is the senior director of Pacific Broadband Satellites Group, working to improve access to reliable, affordable broadband to rural and suburban areas of the Asia Pacific. So I think you'll agree that that's a pretty uh, Fantastic group of people to have here to uh, talk about these sorts of things, this rare depth of experience represented here. It's rare that we actually discuss these issues as an Indo-Pacific group. So I think this could be a really interesting start of an ongoing discussion. Uh, with that said, let's dive right in. Um, Justin, perhaps you could start with a five minute overview of Australia's drivers, the areas that you see as being fruitful for increased tech cooperation in the region. Thanks, uh, thanks, Alex, and uh, great to be here with uh, uh, my uh, panelists. Uh, great to uh, uh, see some uh, some friends and some new faces. Um, uh, the description, uh, Alex, of the event, uh, which refers to 
critical technologies as a core area of uh, the current great power competition taking place in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific. I'd go even further than that, that uh, to ensure that it isn't just limited to great powers, which often uh, in this region uh, can mean uh, restricting the conversation to US and China. Uh, critical technologies really do impact the national security and broader civil society of all our countries. And so we all have a role to play. There is a danger in thinking that we can ignore uh, the tension between the US and China. And there are many different uh, views in uh, in this region. It's uh, uh, more disparate than any other region, uh, whether it be a country like Australia, countries through Southeast Asia, the Pacific, uh, North Asia, where South Asia, uh, we all have uh, different views uh, and we all look at uh, the US and China um, uh, differently. Um, the danger is that we, um, we choose to uh, ignore uh, what is going on there uh, and uh, think that it is just going to resolve itself. The problem is that technology is not restricted by geographical boundaries. Uh, we've all been affected by the technological advancement of the internet and uh, of social media. Uh, and definitely from a government perspective, where I've spent most of my career, mistakes have been made in thinking that the free market would simply take care of itself. It inevitably means that initially uh, we don't do enough collectively. Uh, and then when we realize that something is uh, needs to happen, it's quite late and it's not dealing with the important, it's dealing with the urgent. Uh, and we lurch from no regulation to over-regulation. Uh, and uh, uh, my concern here uh, is uh, that we have done that through uh, the development of the internet and social media. We're now at the advent of artificial intelligence uh, and we're not just dealing with the next evolution of technology, uh, but we are witnessing before our, our very eyes a revolution. Uh, and if we don't participate uh, together, governments, civil society, private sector, uh, we will inevitably be overrun by it. We've traditionally focused on balancing security and economics and, and at different times, uh, those two issues have had different weightings, uh, but the, uh, the, the critical tech, not the difference with where we are going with critical technology is that now the worst case scenario is not just getting the short term security and economics uh, wrong, but is that we misstep uh, uh, and it impacts our long term sovereignty, both uh, online and offline. We need to be together uh, undertaking due diligence, due diligence, both of our own capabilities to ensure that we have uh, a better understanding of our supply chains, uh, also of what our trading partners are capable of and uh, what intent they have with critical technology. Uh, so in terms of specific critical technologies, uh, by way of just a little plug for some great research that ASPE has done over the last couple of years, can't help myself, uh, Alex, uh, the critical tech tracker uh, that your team has done has uh, revealed that China is leading the way on investing in research out of uh, out of 44 critical technologies that were uh, that were looked at, 37 of them has uh, been clear. The data shows that China is leading the way. Uh, what uh, the project also highlights, and this goes to your point of not just looking at competition but collaboration, uh, is that the best way to compete and the best way to give ourselves uh, an alternative is to work together. Uh, and that countries like Australia and countries through Southeast Asia, the Pacific elsewhere, working together, combining our resources is really important. Uh, climate tech is one example uh, that, of course, any uh, advancement in climate tech research and deployment of climate technologies will, have help, will of course, help uh, to reduce emissions. But what we need to do together is to make sure that in doing so, we don't create other um, uh, challenges and problems. We don't want to create supply chain uh, chain monopolies. So we don't want to create area issues where modern slavery comes into play. Uh, so solar panels is an, is an example of that. Uh, so working together in these areas is the best way. And just quickly beyond specific technologies, uh, we can always debate which technologies are most important for us all, where we have particular capabilities. But one area that uh, we can work together on, uh, governments, civil society, private sector, uh, is on standards. Uh, we have, uh, in many areas, worked well over decades to set 
uh, for standard settings and we have standard setting bodies. The issue that we do face at the moment is that technology is getting so far out in front uh, of us all uh, that we risk technology getting so far in front uh, that we are constantly playing catch up. Uh, and so we do need to work together. And I, I note that from an Australian perspective, the government has the current government has asked the National Science and Technology Council to look at AI regulation. Uh, and that will helpfully, hopefully uh, help ensure that we capture the benefits of this great technological era that we're about to encounter while also mitigating the risks. Uh, and that's good for us all, not just nationally, uh, but regionally. Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks, Justin. I uh, appreciate that. I think that's an interesting point about the standard setting bodies and also equally, I think, the ability to, to keep up with that. Um, particularly, I know that the, the US, for example, talks about how governments have vacated that standard setting space and how that's often an industry um, environment now and perhaps looking to remediate some of that, noting that it is so important to understand uh, and to be part of setting those standards to, to uh, ensure that we're kind of staying ahead of some of this technology. So uh, Raji, I, I suppose to put the position from India, from ORF. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And good afternoon, good evening from uh, to all of from wherever you might be joining us today. Uh, ORF is particularly pleased to be partnering with ASPI uh, on some of the tech and security conversations. We have done uh, several projects over the past few years. It's always been uh, fun and uh, educative in working with ASPI as a partner. Um, so in the next few minutes, I'll try and uh, look at a couple of different technologies that I think are the most relevant, uh, but which can also be used to cement closer cooperation between like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific. So, uh, but first, I think there's a big push in the pursuit of technologies, efforts to gain access to critical and emerging tech by the developed and developing countries. I think that's very, very clear. So what's kind of driving the uh, region's pursuit for critical technology, uh, both in the context of economic growth and national security, these technologies are very, very important, accelerating growth and development, augmenting competitiveness, jobs, making more effective quicker decisions, uh, like the in health sector, for instance, or salience of technology in the national security domain. All of this show that the developing countries, as well as the developing uh, developed world, are going to be uh, at the thick of uh, developing this uh, uh, technologies. But I think at the heart of it is also the US-China uh, strategic competition. The competition is precisely because of the heavy dependence and the benefits it brings, be it in terms of upgrading economy or in making military operations more effective and so on and so forth. But even as the competition is gaining greater momentum, they also open up opportunities for cooperation among like-minded partners, which I'll touch upon towards the end of my five minutes. So on the tech competition, let me start with the telecom sector where the 5G rollout became particularly uh, competitive uh, right away. So the initial challenge came from state supported firms like Huawei that sought to capture the 5G telecom market. Uh, state support for companies like Huawei to sell 5G technology at competitive, highly competitive rates gave it a significant advantage and making it an attractive partner for many countries, especially in the developing world. Uh, the threat this posed to telecommunication security led to actions by many countries, including India, to limit Huawei's entry into the telecommunication networks. With support from the Chinese state, Huawei has also been able to develop the has been able to develop the 5G and sell it far cheaper than its competitors. Uh, but Huawei's connection to the Chinese state is also what it's making the telecommunication network, uh, therefore giving the access to China uh, potentially vulnerable to security agencies of Chinese state. Um, another aspect using Chinese apps and telecom service providers is that it allows China to control the type of information that Beijing would want the world to have access to, as well as engage in disinformation campaigns. Uh, India, Australia, and the Quad have cooperated in highlighting this threat from Huawei to other countries, um, thus significantly limiting Huawei's spread. Uh, but this was an early success, but I would not say that has been a completed one, complete one. In the last few years, the threat has expanded when it compared to other areas from platforms and software to critical minerals and semiconductors. The rise in, um, of uh, Chinese apps like TikTok, for instance, is particularly pernicious because it leads to transfer of significant personal data from ordinary citizens to service in China. 
Uh, TikTok has also been a, become a source of news and information that is controlled by China's state authorities, which is another danger to open societies everywhere. A second uh, quick te uh, technology which I want to look at is the semiconductor area and the chip war, uh, the competition. The most pertinent rising threat today comes from China's relative dominance in semiconductor production. Uh, currently, ch though China has advanced in many areas through careful planning, concerted action, and huge amount of resource being poured into it, it still has not achieved much success in controlling all the parts of the semiconductor supply chain. Uh, the U.S. and allies like Taiwan, Japan, South Korea, and the Netherlands still lead the semiconductor industry. However, China is pushing in a determined fashion because, the, because of the importance of semiconductors to not only civilian lives, but also even more critically in military system. Uh, if the current trends were to continue, China could hold the largest share in, uh, of semiconductor manufacturing by the end of the decade. But it also needs to be noted that China is still not capable of manufacturing cutting edge um, computer chips and continues to rely on external supply. And any Chinese success in capturing the semiconductor manufacturing industry would pose major challenges to others. Uh, China has some capacities in this regard, but I think it cannot be expected to produce the high end chips that use very advanced semiconductor nodes. So I think there is still some catching up to do, but I think this also kind of opens up uh, the areas where India, Australia, and other major powers can other other powers can come to collaborate in terms of the uh, in terms of some of these areas. So uh, one of the areas that I do look at, and I think um, that uh, countries can work together. For, so in India, Australia, as well as the United States, for instance, have taken various actions to counter the China challenge in the tech sector. But most of this have been done in a unilateral fashion rather than in a joint uh, fashion. Uh, for example, India was one of the earlier countries to ban the various Chinese apps, including TikTok, in the immediate aftermath of the Galvan clash in 2020. Though this may have been done partly to assuage the domestic public opinion in India for Chinese aggression, it also had important security benefits that are only now being realized. So over the last couple of years, many countries have recognized the threats posed by uh, seemingly innocent Chinese apps, making the interaction quite prescient in a sense. But I think there is a way if we can work together in kind of bringing about concerted action on whether it is banning. So Australia has taken a policy decision to ban TikTok, for instance, but the ban is effective only on government services and government devices. Japan, too, has had has banned TikTok on government de devices. Again, similar to actions taken by several Western countries, uh, including the U.S. Uh, the, in the case of the U.S., they have been banned uh, from the use by federal employees and by state employees in 34 out of the other 50 states. Uh, but the U.S. has affected a number of other policy measures to choke China's access to technology, um, some of them being the in the area of semiconductors, so coming up with the Chips and Science Act, as well as the latest round of technology export controls that came out in 2022 uh, in October uh, to prevent the flow of high technology semiconductors as well as semiconductor manufacturing equipment to China. So my point here, what, what I want to highlight is that though both India, Australia, and even the U.S. have taken unilateral actions, they have not done much jointly to manage the China uh, technology threat from China. There is a lot of scope for India and Australia to add as well as other like-minded partners to cooperate to take such joint actions because joint actions uh, actions are likely to be much more effective. So the first and for the most basic uh, point is to engage in more intense discussions about cooperating on where on areas where India, India and Australia and other Indo-Pacific countries have taken individual measures, for instance, because unilateral measures, like I said, are less effective than joint actions by multiple countries, uh, and especially considering that both India and Australia and other like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific region broadly agree on the threat that they face, initiating dialogue about how to respond to these threats is also critical in a sense. One another area that I think about and I think that's something that needs to be done is the China's use of cyber warfare. India, Australia, Japan, US have been some, some of the most affected in terms of the number of attacks worldwide. While these attacks may not have emanated from China necessarily in all of the cases, a large number of attacks have happened, uh, did come from China. Um, so I think this is another area, but I think there is a need to develop a shared understanding in containing uh, malevolent actors like China that can carry out cyber attacks on critical infrastructure. 
this cooperation can extend to retaliatory action act as a means of deterrence at a later stage. But we are still talking about uh, things at a very uh, nascent stage. But I think developing a shared understanding um, should start with consultation, intelligence sharing about China's cyber capabilities, cyber activities, uh, joint investigation, again, something that can happen at a later stage, but sharing of uh, measures to protect cyber and other critical infrastructure and so on and so forth. But the first and the most basic thing is to develop a common shared understanding uh, also in terms of what might be considered a serious attack that require retaliation and whether such retaliation should be placed uh, should take place in a joint fashion or by the affected parties. Um, I think I'll get on with it uh, during the Q&A and I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Raji. Interesting take there in terms of uh, working together more, more in terms of developing, a, I guess, a common view of thresholds and threats. Um, and, and I suppose a common understanding of how we might respond jointly rather than unilaterally. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and and I'm, I have no doubt we'll get into that during the, the discussion. Um, Ming, if, if you have uh, five minutes to run us through what you think Southeast Asian priorities look like from your point of view, that would be fabulous. Sure, thank you so much, Raji. Thank you, Alex and Justin and, and Nari and everyone who's here. Um, the Tech for Good Institute is super young. We're only 18 months old, so we're very excited to be here um, to speak for our region, but also at such a distinguished platform as ASPIS. Um, we were established to encourage conversations around the ecosystem on how the promise of technology may be leveraged for sustainable, equitable, and inclusive growth for Southeast Asia. And here, we, you know, at Tech for Good Institute, we believe that tech innovation has to serve society and that technology only advances society, but it actually solves problems and improves lives. So I'm a big fan of your critical technology tracker, um, uh, but, critical techno but technology doesn't just mean R&D in our book, but also how that tech is translated into market applications and that innovation also includes business model innovation and driving adoption for new technologies. So it's a long journey from an academic paper um, all the way to actually how it impacts um, society and our lives. Um, Justin, you mentioned AI just now. AI is a technology and an area of research in and of itself. But um, I, I used to be from the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore, and I asked uh, my colleagues to have a look. And that you know, AI has been uh, has AI related applications in all thirty five tech fields, right? So it's actually a vertical piece of research, but it's also horizontal. And basically, AI has been applied in all industries. Um, so to answer your question on technologies which are important to Southeast Asia, I will perhaps under talk about technology verticals, but rather areas that are really important to Southeast Asia. So first, Southeast Asia faces the dual challenge of responding to the effects of climate change um, caused by decades of emissions from the advanced economies and pursuing its own development agendas for some of the fastest growing populations in the world. And so we're really vulnerable to climate disasters, but the energy related emissions from Southeast Asia are expected to more than double as well by 2030. And this is while 65 million people across ASEAN still do not even have access to electricity. So in terms of a technology area, Southeast Asia needs to chart new pathways for low carbon inclusive growth and sustainable electricity supplies, whether it's grid based or decentralized is needed for this low carbon inclusive growth. So all the technologies that fall in that bucket, batteries, anything that's really important. Second, Southeast Asia has leapfrogged many legacy technologies um, so, for example, we have uh, over 330 million smartphone users, um, and they account for 88% of internet users. So people never had a desktop, never had a laptop, and they're just going straight to smartphones. But the possibility of what we call K-shaped growth is what's really seizing the minds of many governments in Southeast Asia. And when I mean K-shaped, it's that the digital and innovation divide continues to grow. Right? Those with resources and capabilities continue to prosper and enjoy the benefits of innovation. And then those with fewer resources or lack of access will fall further and further behind. And a particular segment that we always look at is the micro, small and medium-sized enterprises or MSMEs. 
Southeast Asia has some 71 million MSMEs. They account for like 97% of all businesses, but they only contribute to 40% of national GDPs. So MSME development is a major priority for Southeast Asian governments as a crucial driver to inclusive economic growth, but also social stability, et cetera. So all the technologies that will ensure universal, stable, and affordable connectivity are critical to Southeast Asia's development. I'm sure Mary will have a lot, be able to dive deeper into this area. Um, but I'll add then, in addition to connectivity, we need to enable inclusive access to products and services. So for example, this is where you see the big unicorns in Southeast Asia or the growth in digital economy companies has been the platform companies, Lazada, Grab, Food Pandas, who enable MSMEs to take their first steps into the digital economy. So not technology innovation, so to speak, but business model innovation. But there are technology innovations here that will enable access. Today, one in two Indonesians search using voice, not by typing in, in Google the way that you and I might do. And not for nothing is Google anchoring its next billion user strategy on voice, video, and vernacular. So the big AI giants like Microsoft, Google, et cetera, they will use translation as a use case for generative AI, as a use case for AI's potential to, un to unlock potential and to facilitate access. Now, of course, I belong to an organization called Tech for Good Institute, so I have to be tech optimistic. And certainly when the impact of driving that when impact is a driving purpose of technology, there is much scope to align innovation with the developmental goals of the countries and regions. Um, and it's not only important for economic growth, as you know, our speakers have said before, it's improve, important to improve public services and the relationship between governments and citizens. Um, and from our engagements across Southeast Asia, all governments are leaning into increased connectivity to reach citizens. And in this respect, economic inclusion requires identity inclusion, including digital identities. And there was some element of that in your critical tech um, tracker. But last but not least, as the digital economy grows, um, we need an environment that is safe and secure and resilient. And so this is the third space of concern for Southeast Asia. Since the pandemic, there's been a 600% increase in cyber attacks. And even before the pandemic, we were known as a hotbed for cyber attacks. Um, Alex, this is your area of expertise. I won't dwell on it. Singapore for, uh, inaugurated its fourth military branch last year to defend threats in the digital and cyber domain together with land, air, and sea. Um, machine learning has been deployed to, de to detect threats. That's good, but it's really a cat and mouse games. And emerging technologies with great potential like quantum can also jeopardize existing systems of encryption. And another place to watch, I think um, Raji had mentioned that before, is also the impact of existing platforms and emerging technologies of the social fabric of society. Misinformation and disinformation are really powerful factors, whether it's in the provision of accurate health information as we saw during COVID or in shaping election outcomes. And this is where when we see generative AI, this would you no, know, generative AI will be increasingly capable of producing ever more persuasive content at ever present, you know, greater scale, especially when you have the video. And so very, very sophisticated phishing exercises requires an understanding of your target and human psychology, but disinformation campaigns require creativity and networks. That's what's happening now, but in the future, this can be automated and at massive volume and with much greater precision. So I'll end with my remarks here by stressing that confidence in a safe, secure digital ecosystem and confidence in any emerging technology are really prerequisites in Southeast Asia for unlocking the economic and also social potential for Southeast Asia. Um, and this needs the collaboration. Um, I think, Raji, you talked about collaboration between states, but we also want to stress the collaboration between private, public and civil sectors. Um, this is really important because this lays the foundation for cooperation towards shared outcomes, coordination with clear communication to prevent either knowledge silos or operational silos, and then also co-creation to ensure that um, diverse or underrepresented interests are included and so that the needs and rights of all parties are respected. I'll stop here and I'll be happy to you know, have a conversation later. Excellent. Thanks, Ming. I think that's a really important uh, 
point to make about the, um, making sure that essentially we don't lose sight of what the technology is in aid of and that that needs to be stitched into the fabric of society and embedded in a way that is actually useful and helpful and doesn't develop that kind of two-speed economy or at least make that problem worse. Certainly interested uh, in the later conversation to talk to you about where you think some of that confidence comes from, the confidence in systems and platforms and apps and so on, uh, and how we might be able to contribute to those sorts of things. Uh, as well as I think the the conversation around AI, which is not a um, not a new one, but I think has perhaps come to us more quickly than maybe we imagined that it might, around uh, not just standards and technical standards, but also ethical principles and, and where we sort of sit on that front. I'm equally really interested to understand your, you know, to hear your sort of conversation about making sure that there's accessibility uh, and the way in which people are accessing tech. Um, is fascinating. I think Mary probably that's a nice segue into the to some of the issues that you might want to discuss around accessibility and so on. So I'll open the floor to you. Um, thank you and thanks everyone. I uh, yeah definitely resonated a lot with uh, what Ming was saying. Um, so I'm actually based in Pacific Sydney offices, uh, but I look after the APAC region. So I'm in the Southeast Asia and the Pacific on a monthly basis. And at present, I am actually in Port Moresby for the annual um, Pacific Island Telecommunications Association Forum. <clears throat> and so there's representation here from across the world, but for the Pacific Islands. And we're also discussing essentially similar things that we're discussing on this panel, but obviously with a telecommunications and satellite um, focus. Um, I did have a, th a few things to say, but I, I actually was really taken by one of the conversations I had with the Minister for um, Foreign Affairs and Communications and Justice. You know, weird combo, but from Tuvalu. And um, I was just asking, you know, what are the priorities that you're looking at right now in Tuvalu? And he said that, oh, you know, we're doing that case, I'm um, getting international law to recognize um, our statehood. And uh, we delved deeper into that. And I was like, what does that mean? Why, what's happening at the moment? And, you know, so essentially for context, um, Tuvalu has 10,000 people. Um, it, highest point uh, above sea level is four meters and the rest of the land mass is about two meters above land and they're facing the very real um, possibility of being completely submerged and so it's a country that is trying to figure out how do we still maintain maintain our governance our identity cultural and political um, if we have no physical land mass and it was simultaneously really heartbreaking, but also really interesting because they're doing this digital island, digital nation project. So they're essentially trying to move their entire governance um, and cultural identity online. And that more or less kind of is what I wanted to focus on in terms of key priorities um, and drivers in the region um, from a tech perspective. So first of all, um, anything to do with regards to um, climate security and then also connectivity. And so for me, um, it's essentially satellite technology, which I think will be the key enabler um, for collaboration and resilience in this region. So I think first of all, um, Earth observation satellites um, the Australian government has actually launched um, an Earth, oh, actually, I think it's still under review, um, but essentially an Earth observation program um, partnering with CSIRO and, and BOM and I think Defence. And essentially the idea is that you use these Earth observation satellites for monitoring, environmental monitoring. Um, here it's, I guess, flooding, bushfires, and um, with similar natural disasters happening in the Pacific, there's definitely areas for collaboration um, and data sharing um, and as well as education and uplift um, in that regard. And then I think where I'm kind of more involved with Pacific being a communication satellite provider, uh, we often come in at the natural disaster emergency relief um, section as well. And we are connecting, ensuring that the country gets connected back online as soon as possible so that they can continue to operate, reconnect the economy and so on. And so I do think there's, um, there's a lot of 
advancements that are happening with satellites um, to ensure that the economies in the Pacific, um, I guess, are one connected. So the communication satellites, we typically uh, back up for the terrestrial telecom providers um, who can't reach the most remote areas. And I think for a memory, there's about 49% of the Asia Pac um, population live in rural or remote areas. And so effectively that means that the current terrestrial networks um, only serve this half of the population. So I think um, you know what's really important for myself and for the Pacific um, is that we, before we can, I guess, get too advanced with technology, is one, just getting people connected um, and then how do you keep them safe? So if I kind of go back to the Tuvalu um, digital nation example, um, you know, when you're moving your entire governance and cultural identity online, um, what, I mean, it, it, it's even riskier and, um, sorry, it's even riskier when you're at risk of, sorry, cyber attacks. And I guess in a region, if you're trying to think about harmonization of standards and um, you know how you approach cybersecurity as a region and something we're discussing at this conference, I guess, how do you do that when um, Australia and New Zealand are the main trading partners as well as um, donors, but there are there is quite a lot of Chinese presence in the region. And so what does that mean in terms of what does that harmonization look like and how does interoperability across tech, especially um, communication tech and um, satellite providers. How does that, I guess, work out? But um, yeah, so I, I guess for myself, uh, in terms of the critical tech, definitely the communication technologies, um, the SAT tech, and um, yeah, just looking forward to hearing everyone else's thoughts. Thanks, Mary. I think that's, I mean, that is a really powerful kind of story, the Tavillo story, that, that really not just moving from to kind of e-governance but having to skip almost entirely through to replicating digital twinning, essentially, not just your economy but your society. Um, as you say, fascinating project but also a really difficult one to have to talk about given uh, what it means in terms of climate change and so on. Um, Look, a series of really, really interesting inputs here, I think, and certainly reflective of the different areas that we're talking about here. Some common themes broadly around, uh, obviously, you know, areas where it's possible to perhaps harmonise uh, or standardise things around cybersecurity, um, potentially our thresholds for what we think cyber attack looks like and so on. Equally, though, I think really interesting to see the kind of emphasis on uh, accessibility and on communications and on making sure that people are not left behind, that we remain connected. Um, and the key there really is, is, at least in the first instance, telecommunications, whether that's terrestrial or satellite um, based. That's going to depend really on the area and the region in which you're operating. Um, and I think potentially looking at, at uplift education data sharing across the board, um, that there's more scope to do that, even if we fundamentally don't always reach agreement on, uh, you know, what to do next. Um, certainly being able to kind of share our experiences and uh, talk them through as Indo-Pacific nations that are dealing with many of the same sorts of challenges. So um, we'll move, I think, now into a broader kind of question and answer session, but I, I did want to open the floor and just ask if, if any of our panellists wanted to comment on anything else that they'd heard other panellists discuss, wanted to pick up on any of those points. Uh, Raji, I think I see, yeah. I see a hand. Uh, you know, th thanks uh, thanks for all the presentations. I think they were terrific conversations complementing each other in many ways when you look at it. And I uh, agree with you, Ming, completely when I talk about uh, uh, collaboration between states. Um, uh, I meant more of collaboration. And I couldn't agree with you more in terms of bringing together the different stakeholders. And I think especially when you talk about uh, the critical and emerging technology without the private sector, without the civil society, and without the active participation of the different stakeholders involved, you're not going to be able to bring about even standards, regulations, anything. So even to have meaningful conversations, it is, it's absolutely essential that we have the participation of all the different stakeholders. So I, I just wanted to echo that. I want to
kind of reiterate uh, my um, uh, sort of uh, my own um, uh, sort of a, uh, a take on that particular aspect. And I think that's something that we really need to work together. Uh, developing standards in the current context of the geopolitics is going to be extremely challenging. So maybe it's even easier and maybe it's uh, wiser to start in some smaller conversation, develop consensus in smaller groupings um, involving the different stakeholders, but maybe a smaller grouping of nations to come to the, to, the, to first develop that consensus, take that bit of consensus to a slightly bigger platform at a later stage, and then take it to a global platform, multilateral platform. But I think we need to go step by step because given the current international security political climate, it is going to be extremely challenging to develop that consensus that is required. The consensus has been broken for quite some time. So um, getting there involves all the different stakeholders, but but maybe we do it in smaller groupings among like-minded partners as a first step before we get there. I just wanted to kind of make that point. Thank you. That, that's a really great point, uh, Raji, I think in terms of, and, and goes to the point I was about to, or the question I was about to ask, which is really where we think that, which forums might work for these sorts of, this. Uh, options for collaboration. I think the, the the interesting thing about this grouping, as we've said, is that very often we're not all represented in the same kind of political groupings. You've got the PIF, you've got ASEAN, ASEAN plus three, whatever the sort of configurations are, uh, you're, never all, you're never all in one room or it's rare to have everybody in one room. Uh, and equally, I think there's a question about whether all of these conversations are government to government, whether we look at business to business. So I'm very interested to kind of hear the panellists' take on where there might be uh, productive avenues for these conversations to, to continue. Maybe I can just offer my point of view, um, because I think, Justin, you used the word nurturing, which is from nothing to maybe over-regulation just now. Um, and I think... It's probably a truism all over the world that basically government moves slow, but business moves fast. And uh, in the tech space, it's, it's even faster than ever. And so one of the things that we've been finding, you know, in our own little way at the Tech for Good Institute to be able to play a small role is to be able to bring these different stakeholders together um, to share perspectives in a way that's not a, a, a very transactional or a, you know, in a very transactional manner. Um, we, you know, quite often when the tech companies meet the regulators, it's usually to get scolded. Um, and that's not a great place to be building understanding. Um, at the same time, you have uh, increasing knowledge, information, and data asymmetry between what government has and what, um, and what, uh, and, and what's being held behind um, sort of private walls, so to speak. Um, the tech tracker is based on um, published documents. You know, I'd love to see your work go into using patent data, for example. And even with patent data, you then have confidential data that's being held behind, you know, by, by companies that, that will just never see the light of day. So I think those conversations are really important. Um, the Tech for Good Institute, we ran something for ASEAN last year. And um, the, the, the chairman who opened our session, and it was, this was based on digital startups and, 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 and a new tech innovate, you know, innovation startups, high growth companies in Southeast Asia. And um, his offhand comment was that he had never seen so many sneakers at um, an ASEAN event, um, which we took as a thumbs up because this was exactly what you needed to bring um, the private sector and the public sector and the civil society sector to come together in a very open and honest way because when you build the you know when things are hot that's not a great time to be building relationships or sharing information great point ming i think i mean that is often the way of course isn't it where where government brings industry in either to consult you know in the form of we're developing policy and we would like stakeholder input and or, as you say, sometimes for platforms particularly, very often brought in to be uh, told that they need to do better and that the burden of, of uh, security and proof should lie with the platform rather than, say, the consumer. Um, and, and in those circumstances, not necessarily always the point to be making, uh, you know, constructive kind of relationships and, and um, policy. How then do we go about 
uh, changing that, improving that, and perhaps bringing business and government together, industry and government together in a way that's more constructive, more regular, and is not either in the form of, um, you know, policy input or in the form of uh, regulation, for example, which is the other classic in Australia as well. I don't want to hog the conversation. I'll just give two quick examples. Um, I think that and this can be within a country or across you know, regional groupings like Raji mentioned. Um, but I, I think that when policymakers realize that they have a range of different tools that they can use to um, induce uh, or, or, or encourage good behavior, um, that becomes really powerful. Governments in general have actually very big market power. Um, you know, because they are, they, are, they are also procurers of services. That's a big deal. Um, we see uh, great, so, you know, great examples, good or some not so good examples of industry-led uh, sort of self-regulation. I think um, in Australia, you've got an example, Buy Now, Pay Later has been uh, an example of really, really good um, collaborative uh, effort to be able to, to, uh, to raise standards. Um, in Southeast Asia, one of the things which is of great interest is on sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes, to be able to test where actually regulations need to change in light of new technologies, but still actually keeping consumers or keeping society safe. Um, and so I think when you broaden that sort of, uh, you broaden that that toolkit or tool belt of, of, of policy innovations that you can have. But you are, keep in mind and you share the outcomes and you are very clear together on what the outcomes are, then I think that policy and, and, and policy making can also move into the digital age. Yeah, I'll also, I'll stop here to let the others um, share their thoughts. Uh, Elsie, I, I, um, it is a fascinating uh, conversation and it's a, it's a wicked dilemma. Um, it, Mary correctly talked about uh, satellite tech, space tech, uh, and what it means for communities and uh, economic prosperity, uh, communication. Um, uh, but if we have a look at how much that has changed over the last uh, few decades, uh, even the last decade, that it wasn't long ago where space tech uh, satellites were really limited to major powers um, whereas now it is fully commercialized uh, and the private sector is uh, uh, they're the ones who are innovating uh, and uh, getting well in front of uh, of governments and we just have a look at the the likes of what uh, musk is doing uh, and so we now have in these spaces uh, the private sector uh, who are um, so much more technologically advanced, they're taking more risks than government. Um, uh, governments traditionally take time, they test. Um, uh, the, what we're seeing now in the private sector, they're using practice as their tests. Um, we see with uh, ChatGBT or, or the chatbots, uh, where they are all working out, uh, well, many of them are working out the flaws uh, by testing them on on humans, um, and so we're all live guinea pigs. Uh, so it is a wicked dilemma. How do you how do you go beyond what has been really trusted government to government uh, relations over many issues dealing with standards, both at technical and as you said ethical uh, levels, and that goes from um, uh, non military technologies to uh, to uh, to military technologies all the way through to uh, nuclear tech. Uh, now we have the private sector uh, not just uh, doing work for governments, but actually doing work by themselves uh, and well out in front. So uh, it is an issue. I, I think part of an answer is to start talking about it. The worst thing we can do uh, is uh, try to um, uh, to wait it out uh, and to say, well, let's see where everybody gets to. We need to, even without having a single uh, entity to discuss we need multiple entities, uh, whether it be the you know the great ORF Rosina dialogue, uh, our own Sydney dialogue. Um, uh, government um, uh, can uh, is doing things. The Quad uh, is an.
Does this, <clears throat> does this mean that my PNG internet is better than Canberra internet? I can't yeah, hear very, either. I think for me, Justin is frozen. Yeah, Maybe just Alex. looks like. Yeah. We um, just hang on. And I mean, wait. I mean, if he's he can, uh, I'd like to just jump in on what he was saying. But are, are we going to wait for him just so we've um, across the <laughs> discussion? Um, I don't know if the audience kept, is frozen or not. Let me just uh, check with somebody. The audience can. Oh, I just realized that Alex fired. is frozen too. Yeah. So Aspia frozen. Uh oh, Nate left. Oh, no, ah. <laughs> so we're going to carry up with the conversation. No, the audience wow. seems to be here. Oh, someone the, says, Mary, ah, you can still... continue. Yes. Oh, well, thank okay. you. Um, so yeah, we're definitely... my guy says, the Aspie people are the only one. That are... <laughs> yeah. So um, okay. how, I, I actually, you know, I was so, because we did my testing when I was in Tonga last week. And now I'm in PNG. I did another test just to make sure I didn't cut out. But um, happy I'm not the one that's cut out. So, yeah, as Justin was saying, you know, I think one in my role in corporate development, um, I have a mix of you know private and public sector engagement. And so, I find that every single country that I travel into, um, you know, I have to talk about licenses, um, you know, orbital slots, and so on, and. And so I, I generally meet with each regulator and I'm having the same conversation with every regulator, but every single country is doing a different thing. And to my understanding, um, you know, these, there, are, there are forums where the regional regulators and global regulators, you know, under the, um, the UN conference organizers on global symposium. Um, my understanding is that they get together and they talk about how they should be more streamlined. But I think, you know, for myself in the, field when I'm out there, it's, um, it's really difficult. And I, I actually don't, um, I, I can't see a very clear pathway to a standardization, um, you know, even in some countries getting the different states and the different islands to, to agree on even just definitions, like, oh, what is cybersecurity um, to us or to you? And so actually, so I'm not being helpful at all, but essentially I was saying it's very complex. And um, yeah, I'd love to, you know, I think there's all the policies and so on that we're, we're writing, but every time I'm practically being you know, out there in the field, I just don't see a lot of it being implemented. And I'd love to be part of the conversation somehow and any ideas. I think you're, you're absolutely yes. right, Mary. For us, you know, aligning outcomes and reaching consensus, which is one of the key themes that Alex wanted us to talk about, is actually only the first step. It's really, really hard, but that's really only the first yeah. step. Um, and the ability to apply whatever frameworks that get agreed on is a whole other ballgame. And, you know, in Southeast Asia too, countries always ask, well, we've got this now, but how do you localize your regional or international framework so that they are fit for purpose? You know, we can actually implement it. It's actually in a realistic way. Um, that's, that's really uh, what we hear a lot. Um, information sharing and best practice sharing is, yeah. is great. You know, it's not like this is how you do it, but let us tell you how we did it, and that might be helpful. Exactly. Um, the technical assistance, um, and for, when we mean technical assistance, it can be, you know, like the ADBs and the, you know, uh, all of the other uh, development banks, but also private to public. And this goes back to the private sector having a lot of expertise, private to public and then public to people um, is, you know, some of the ways in which that, you know, seems to be necessary in the conversations. It's not silver bullet, but absolutely necessary to, to, to acknowledge that reaching consensus is hard, but that was only the first step. Uh, okay, I just got a message because I think the Aspie internet is down. We are just fixing it up. So I think, that, okay, we are down to our last six minutes in any case. 
Uh, but I think uh, yeah, just one point I wanted to kind of uh, uh, something that Justin brought out, and I something uh, space is something that I usually work on a lot. But today I was trying to focus on some of the other other technology, other issues in a sense. Uh, so one thing that I've heard about, uh, especially when talking about from a global governance perspective, uh, you are talking about the governance uh, in Vienna at the COPUS, the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, or whether you are talking about uh, uh, CD, the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva, where space security arms control issues are talked about. Uh, I think uh, I, I, I'm pro providing another perspective, that the perspective from uh, some of the major Asian powers who are also the established space players who are completely against uh, providing uh, a private sector a, a, a sort of a, a seat at the table in a sense. Uh, because, and I think mm -hmm. that's some um, countries like, and that comes from the fact that most of these countries in Asia, they have had, uh, primarily their space program run by the state agencies. And therefore, um, uh, they believe that they have articulated, the, and as many words, to, to say that uh, giving the private sector a seat at the high table uh, in terms of their ability to articulate something in, in terms of regulations, standards, all of the best practices, it is going to give the best a bigger advantage. And therefore, countries like China, countries like uh, India also, to some extent, have resisted having the private sector a seat at the table. Not not saying that they are not important, but giving them a seat. But I think that might be changing given that both uh, uh, all the major Asian powers, including China, China has now uh, hundreds and hundreds of space startups that have come up in recent times, uh, recent years, very recent years. Uh, India is also kind of embracing, beginning to kind of engage the private sector in a much more active fashion. So I would think that as the private sector interactions, engagements go up, their comfort level to provide them with a seat at the table, especially on global governance issues also, uh, that comfort will also go up, I would think, and they can be uh, much more. Because so far, what I heard uh, is that, you know, you can get the views of the private sector through the government agencies, but they don't need to sit at the table kind of thing. But I think that that's something that could change um, in the coming years for sure. Rajiv, uh, back after a short illness. Here we are. Um, good to see everybody and apologies for that small breakdown in critical technology there. Uh, interesting point that you make, though. I think we see that in some very specific instances, in you know, with the term military industrial complex in which you really do have a, seri a series of kind of industry and private sector players who are hand in glove uh, with government. Um, I think you could stand to see that model spread beyond perhaps that that initial kind of defence militarised approach to a more economic, social uh, and, and, you know, perhaps other aspects of government, um, particularly things like industry, infrastructure, some of the portfolios in Australia, I'm thinking that would benefit from a much closer relationship with industry, partly because, you know, as, as I think Justin was midway through saying before we, we lost contact, um, increasingly the levers and the, the, I guess the decision making powers and the, and the um, technology is in the hands of that private sector. So it really government in many ways a price taker um, and looking at shaping uh, regulation and shaping standards in that way rather than necessarily being a direct, uh, you know, designer of that tech, if that makes sense. Um, Alex, uh, just just uh, thirty seconds to, to finish uh, off because it's yeah. relevant. I think I came in part way through. Apologies, I lost connection too. But with Raji talking about more uh, people and in industry at the table, uh, I think part of the challenge uh, we uh, we have with government and civil society like us uh, is if you take Elon Musk as an example, a, a clear leader. Uh, of the critical technology that we're talking about, whether it be Mary talking about space tech, uh, you know, amazing technology. Uh, but he has, or that's not really where he makes his money at the moment. Uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the car technology, Tesla, um, uh, all the technology that he has through China. Uh, we have to now face that we are in an era that if we put and Elon Musk at the table, which you would imagine that if we were looking at industry leaders of critical technology at the table, um, uh, someone like Musk would need to be there. Uh, is Who is he, though, representing? Um, uh, is he representing purely if we're talking about the technology that Mary wants to focus on in a meeting on, on, technology, on uh, satellites or space? Uh, or is he looking at his individual um, empire build 
and saying, I need to represent the um, Chinese Communist Party here because if I don't, my business interests are going to be affected. Uh, so the, it is really something that we need to grapple with, which is why uh, some form of regulation is vital uh, and why government involvement is necessary now, uh, not necessarily in an interference way, but involvement is mandatory. But that I think also suggests to me, Justin, that you would be looking at not just uh, the, the where government impinges on industry through regulation and through standards and so on, but equally how the rules of engagement in terms of how industry is brought into that tent, as Raji was, was suggesting, in order to be part of the conversation early. Um, I did promise I would try and get to some questions. I know that with a, with a brief interlude, we're probably running close to time, but I, there's a couple here if people are prepared to, to have an initial sort of think about some of these. Um, one, of the, one of the questions here on standards, traditional standards are more about interoperability and entering economies driven by industry and less about ethics and principles. So how do we bridge that gap between renewed national interest in AI? Uh, and how standards are developed in bodies such as the ISO. So I, I, that's an open question. I don't know if there's anyone who specifically wants to have a, an initial uh, response to that. So, um, so okay, let me just uh, take a first crack at it. Uh, I, I, I think uh, this is something that Bani and I did talk about just a couple of months ago when we were in Brisbane for a tech uh, uh, conference uh, for a day. Um, so I had not really thought about as to how the technical, uh, traditional, uh, the standard setting is such a uh, important thing in terms of developing interoperability, common language to understand each other, what they're talking about, and also entering economies. Uh, I had not thought about it as to because I thought they would be more focused on the technical aspects and that's about it. And therefore, I had not really given much. But I think uh, it's it's important. Uh, and I get the point as to what Bani is trying to say. And I think that's very important if you have to be able to strengthen the kind of cooperation between uh, states, industry bodies and so on and so forth. But there is also one another point I would like to say that any standards, any regulations that are being brought about, they go through three different sets of uh, steps or three different facets in a sense. One is the technical standard, technical process of arriving at, at developing either legal means or uh, confidence building measures. So that's a technical steps in understanding what are those technical steps that we need to put into place in order to regulate, in order to moderate the kind of behavior that we, in kind of activities that we engage in. The second aspect is in terms of the legal aspects. If, if it is a legal instrument, you bring in the lawyers to talk about what are those different commitments to be made and so on and so forth. But I think the most challenging aspect is the political aspect. The political, unless you have the political will, uh, will of the cut of the leadership of the countries, then there is very little progress that you can make. So I think we also need to spend a lot of time in order to understand how do we bridge that political gap that has become so huge now. The impediments that have come in the way of developing that political confidence in each other, trust in each other. Um, uh, can we start with some basic? information sharing, confidence building measures as a first step in order to just build that kind of confidence in each other so that you can achieve more uh, in the in the coming years. Technical standards are absolutely necessary, but I think the political aspects cannot be completely given up because I think without that building that political will by the states, it's very difficult to make real progress uh, in, in the especially in current um, times. Thanks, Raji. And certainly I, I would suggest probably the same in Australia as in India. It's about building uh, political will, states within states as well, given that we're looking at kind of fed, federal kind of system here as well. Um, can I ask then in, in terms of, might put this question to each of you as far as the, the specific barriers to cooperation or perhaps to nominate one or two things that you really see as being blockers to cooperation that we might be able to then consider um, and perhaps that 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 was yours, Raji, potentially, but but the, that prevent us, I, I think, from kind of moving beyond that and into that that world of opportunity around critical technology. What are the things that hold us back? Uh, I might throw to you, Ming, in the first instance, just to. Hi, thank you so much. I mean, we we did address some of these issues. Um, 
just now when when uh, the internet for you guys went down. I, I think I wouldn't call it a blocker, so to speak. I think a challenge that Mary and I were talking about is that whether you have standards or frameworks or whatever, actually, you know, the rubber hits the road when you actually have to implement it. And um, when you cannot implement it because it's a capability thing, or as uh, Raji mentioned, it's because there are laws that need to be changed to be able to align. Those are um, the actual implementation becomes becomes very very challenging, and um, so that that's an issue. I think the other issue is also that uh, every country has every country you know um, in the world, and certainly in, in Southeast Asia, you know, wants to protect national interests, national sovereignty, and to be able to maintain autonomy. Um, but very broadly speaking, for Southeast Asia, the common goal is economic growth and development within a stable region. And that's one thing that I think um, most Southeast Asian, all Southeast Asian, most Southeast Asian countries can agree on. And also that an integrated digital economy will serve that interest. And so to that interoperability question, you know, that seamless exchange of compatibility and you know, of services and infrastructure across systems and jurisdictions is really important for adoption and also the building of trust. Um, and, you know, I, 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 my analogy is always that of biometric passports, um, that you needed cooperation at so many different levels, at the international organization level, at the national level, and at the technical, you know, the, all of the technical levels for that to actually, to, for that to actually happen. Thanks, Ming. I think we had a very similar thing with the with the national identity card, that kind of vertical integration and making sure that you had all layers in agreement there. Mary, uh, have you possibly this is something already covered as well, but just in terms of where you think a critical barrier lies or a challenge to to us moving forward into that opportunity space? Mm -hmm. Well, I think specifically from a um, sat tech perspective, um, it's for the Pacific, um, probably a couple of things. So one is a lack of, um, what is a, um, and this isn't this isn't actually specific to the Pacific, but I think generally, um, you know, satellites are still a bit of an unknown um, in terms of, you know, I don't know, people thought there was one type of satellite. I'm like, no, there's like several different types of satellites and they do different things. And, <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, a blocker for getting I guess better access, let alone standardization for sat tech is um, is an education. So um, I also find some of the ISPs who we need to partner with from as a B two B company don't quite understand some of the tech and some of the infrastructure and how that integrates into their platforms. And that's also a fault of the satellite operators who typically haven't been interested in doing that. Um, so definitely a lack of education, um, a lack of communication. So when I one particular country um you know where i'm trying to um get us some visa licenses um i've spoken with about five different entities from government as well as uh, isp and everyone has a different uh, price and understanding of what that visa license fee is and i just with that inconsistency i'm just like well I, I really don't know how we kind of move forward together because all those stakeholders who have different views are necessary to implement and finalize a contract um yeah so for myself on the ground it's definitely um an education piece as well as a communication piece thanks mary uh Raji, was there anything that you had wanted to add to your previous comments around some of the blockers that you've seen in your... Yeah, just very quickly, I think, uh, so if you're talking about cooperation among like-minded partners in the Indo-Pacific, I think one of the first things that we need to do is also developing appropriate framework documents that would facilitate closer cooperation it's conversation to start with because uh, the the absence of framework uh, i think tend to slow down the progress even if there is 
political will. So political will is usually a, a sort of an impediment. But in this particular case, I've seen uh, there is political will, but absence of technical framework, some basic documentations in terms of on uh, security of information being shared and so on and so forth. I think those are uh, important measures that need to uh, sort of uh, that that are required in order to make progress in a sense. Um, I'm not going to get into details, but in one of the past uh, in my experiences when we were working with some of the our Australian colleagues, uh, we were trying to develop some recommendations in terms of what we can do together. And one of the uh, recommendations from the Indian side we were talking about was that uh, are the uh, CERT institutions, the computer emergency response teams, uh, the CERT team should have a conversation with CERT Australia um, so that we understand you know, where cybersecurity, uh, 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 the vulnerabilities are, and what are the kind of ways to share uh, real-time intelligence information and so on and so forth. But I was, uh, we were kind of told that, you know, that may not happen right away because um, they may not be that comfortable. Uh, they are not comfortable as it in terms of because we don't have sort of agreements in place to uh, kind of get into uh, such kind of deeper, con sensitive conversations. Second aspect, I think it's also that India is not part of the Five Eyes uh, or any alliance arrangement and so on and so forth. And of course, India collaborates with uh, countries like Russia. So that, again, is somewhat of a dampener in, in terms of how uh, uh, India's new security partners look at looks at in and they look at India in a sense and how much cooperation. So I think even though the um, sort of uh, India's Russia engagement is going through some very uh, uh, challenging period, and I think it's been coming down. But I think India still does not, for instance, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. India still has not called out Russia by name. So there are a uh, cer certain amount of hesitancies in some parts, and I think that might um, somewhat complicate. I wouldn't say blockading, but I think this are uh, challenging. So we need to find ways to get around that. So it does that does signing some sort of an information security agreement resolve some of these issues, for instance, uh, having between the US and India, for instance, the uh, five foundational defense agreement have been signed. And that has facilitated greater cooperation in, ter in terms of providing uh, intelligence and so on and so forth. So can we think about ways to how do we look at some of the framework agreements and so on and so forth that can actually facilitate cooperation between uh, whether it is computer emergency response teams or even other areas and so on and so forth. So those are things that I think we are practical level because there is a lot of political will. So we need to find ways to kind of get over some of these hesitancies in uh, through technical means in a sense. Let me stop there. I, yeah, absolutely. I think that that kind of concept of finding where there is political will, you've already, you know, obviated one of those issues, and then you can move towards practical cooperation in specific areas. Um, just in dying 30 seconds of this, we've gone a little bit over because we were, we were uh, interrupted mid flow. Um, anything that you specifically want to call out as a blocker? And the reason I asked this question is because it in in talking about the blockers and the obstacles, people actually also talk about how to find their way through those. So we can wrap up with that in a moment. Yeah, uh, look, I completely agree with what Raji uh, just said. Um, I, I think, uh, and without harping on the need for governments and industry to work together, which Ming, everyone has been talking about, uh, we are at the moment at risk of working on uh, two tracks, uh, industry on its own and government on its own. Uh, we have to work together uh, and we have to remove the disincentive that there has been there um, for decades on government to be involved. If you have a look, we've got to learn from history uh, to, so we don't repeat the same mistakes. The internet was developed not by forgetting about security, but specifically saying we'll come back to security later on because we wanted a, a, a platform of interoperability. Uh, let's have the research world work together. Let's worry about security later. Social media was developed with the big tech companies saying to government, stay out of our way. Uh, any government involvement would stifle innovation. Uh, we need them to work together. Uh, in part goes to what Ming said about um, our region in particular, Southeast Asia wants economic prosperity in a stable region. If we don't have governments and industry talking about security measures, there may very well be economic prosperity in the short term, but we won't get the second part. We won't have regional stability over the long term. So one of the things I think that is a blocker that we need to get through is actually to work together on what is what do we consider 
unacceptable behavior. So we've got to work out, yes, what's acceptable, but I think we have to have conversations on what is unacceptable, work out what is malicious, and then agree that between governments, industry, we actually call out that malicious behavior so that we have actually some standards to work from. And even if it becomes a norm-based um, requirement rather than an initial uh, rule legislative-based requirement, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. So look, I mean, very interesting conversation, obviously a lot of different threads we could pull on here. The kind of common themes that seem to come out of this are really that, that need for interoperability and interoperability between systems, but also between industries and between governments. And I think that goes to the point that uh, everyone here has made as not necessarily representing government, but also kind of understanding the need for government to play a role uh, and to develop standards of a kind, whether those standards are norms or something more technical and specific. Uh, trust, I think, is another kind of part of a conversation that's come up with um, a degree of uh, a sense really that, that trust is essential in order to have industry at the table, for example, for government to trust industry in that relationship, but equally um, to develop the kind of understanding and education piece that sits underneath that so that we are, we're all kind of aware of what we need to be focused on and what our stand, what the standard is that we're reaching for here. I'm not sure that we've settled necessarily on areas of common interest as far as um, beyond perhaps telecommunications and beyond perhaps some of the things that we know would facilitate that kind of um, bringing as many individuals in each nation into the future and into these critical technologies as, as uh, we possibly can. But I think this is a really good start to a conversation that it behooves us to continue. Uh, and I certainly think that when we talk about government and industry, we really are those people who can who can have these conversations. We can run that 1.5 track conversation where we have the kind of connections to bring these people into the room uh, and continue that conversation, whether that is through Ricina, through the Sydney Dialogue, through uh, the 1.5 tracks that attach to things like the Quad or the PIF. So, uh, Thank you so much. It all, it all it really uh, remains for me to do is to thank our panellists uh, for their time, their expertise and their input. Hugely appreciate that. Um, we will uh, be putting out, I think, I hope, a transcript of this, depending on whether the internet um, gave us a small, <laughs> there could be some long pages of blank material there, but we'll get there. Um, and we'll send that on um, uh, to uh, participants as well as to panellists who have participated with intelligence and humour on all of these topics. Um, and we hope very much to see you again. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.